for approximately 40 minutes, at which point we'll then split up into smaller groups so that we can have a discussion. That will last about 10 minutes, and then we'll come back with questions for David, about one question per group. The question and answer session, we plan to go on till about 7.30, and we will try to keep to time, bearing in mind people have different uh, responsibilities. Just a reminder to make sure that your microphone is muted at all times. This ensures that there's no unpleasant feedback and everyone can get the best experience possible. A few of you may have heard of a couple of occasions where people have disrupted Zoom meetings and we have a security team on hand to address any such issues if they arise. So with all that taken care of, I have the great pleasure of introducing our speaker tonight. Uh, I think it's no exaggeration to say that David Harvey is arguably the world's foremost Marxist intellectual, author of more than 27 books in which he's analysed the evolution of the capitalist system and made extremely important theoretical contributions to debates in geography, urban studies, as well as on the topics of neoliberalism, imperialism and the works of one Karl Marx. He's a distinguished professor of anthropology and geography at the Graduate Centre of the City University of New York and we're extremely lucky to have him here today to preview some of the themes of his latest book, The Anti-Capitalist Chronicles, in which he introduces new ways of understanding the crisis of global capitalism and the struggles for a better world. He also organises online courses with podcasts for both Capital and now the Grundry set, I believe, which have proven incredibly popular. For all these reasons and many more, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our speaker for this evening, David Harvey. Over to you. Okay, well, uh, thank you for having me. And uh, I hope that uh, you can all hear me okay. Um, the, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm particularly pleased to do this because uh, First off, I'm, I'm, I'm locked down in my apartment and it's driving me crazy. So, but also I, I have very uh, strong uh, connections to Scotland. Uh, my uh, maternal grandfather was uh, Scottish. Uh, he was an amalgamated engineer who, I guess, picked up his skills and his trade in John Brown's shipyard in, on the Clyde. Uh, at some point or other, he came south to the naval dockyard in Chatham. Uh, and there, I presume, he met uh, my grandmother. And uh, so my mother was born. And this all happened in the 1890s, 1901 or something of that kind. But uh, there was an extended Scottish uh, family. And I actually do have a memory that I of uh, VJ Day, that is the, the day the victory over Japan uh, occurred, and I actually celebrated it uh, on Princes Street in Edinburgh. So I, uh, I, you know, I have these sort of very strong uh, memories of this. But uh, also speaking of uh, family background, uh, on my, on my uh, father's side, uh, I saw a family tree and uh, this was some years ago, and I suddenly noticed that half of the family got wiped out in 1918. And I, it was only at that point that I realized that there was a great pandemic uh, in 1918, which did a huge da damage. And, and here I am sort of hiding from a pandemic in New York City, uh, which has been uh, quite a, uh, an experience. Uh, I've not got out very much. And when I do go out, I take a walk uh, down the East River and uh, the walk takes me behind uh, Bellevue Hospital and uh, there are all these white uh, big refrigerated trucks uh, stuck there uh, a few weeks ago. Uh, and that was actually uh, temporary morgues to handle the number of people who were dying. So my, my great strategy being uh, in, the, uh, in the height of the victim sort of uh, situation was to try to keep out of those white trucks. And I'd hurry on by them and hurry on back and sort of hide here again. So I'm, I'm, I'm hidden up here. But there's another kind of connection which is interesting, which is 
the one thing I was doing while this was going on was teaching the Grundrisse, uh, which Marx wrote in 1858, F57-58. And he wrote it at a moment of considerable uh, disruption in the British economy, uh, a crisis of capital. Uh, but there didn't seem to be much activism. And so what he did was to spend his time in the British Museum and write the Grundrisse, which is a pretty mind blowing text. And I was kind of thinking to myself, well, I have nothing very much to do, uh, you know, being locked away here. Um, so teaching the Grundrisse, and now I'm busy turning it into a written version, uh, as sort of a companion to reading uh, the Grundrisse. But there's a lot goes on in the Grundrisse, which is, I think, uh, extremely uh, relevant uh, to what is happening uh, in the here and here and now. And of course, the here and now is very much dominated by uh, the rise up and the uh, multiracial protests, which uh, are, you know, really, really impressive, uh, given the situation uh, in this country, uh, around uh, the whole kind of questions of uh, race. And this was uh, before uh, George Floyd's murder. Uh, there were a, a lot of uh, discussions beginning to emerge about uh, the differential impact uh, of the virus and uh, clearly the death rate in African-American uh, parts of uh, New York City was much much higher uh, than elsewhere. Uh, what really came out was of course that 40 years of neoliberalism had shredded the public health uh, capacities of local governments and uh, even national governments. Uh, and uh, those who were most uh, affected by this were uh, marginalized communities and all of the data which we were getting showed uh, this differential impact of, uh, of the virus. At the same time, uh, so there was a differential impact uh, of uh, the deaths in the virus, uh, the population which was being recruited to keep uh, uh, the city running uh, and in particular to man the health care system, uh, that population clearly w was uh, people of color, Hispanics uh, and, and, and the like. So uh, not only was the, 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 the whole system uh, being run by that population, for, for pretty lousy wages. Uh, they were the ones who were keeping everything going while the rich were disappearing to out in their houses out in the Hamptons and isolated and all the rest of it. So uh, there was already a kind of a sense that there was something chronically unfair about this virus, which we kept on hearing doesn't supposedly respect uh, social boundaries. Well, uh, yes, it does and no, it doesn't. Uh, the, is, is the real story. So there was beginning to be a recognition that something had to be done about uh, the public health structures. Something had to be done about uh, social inequality. And, and in particular, something had to be done about uh, the racial distinctions. And then came uh, the George Floyd killing and then that immediately uh, rose attention to the policing question and, and so here, 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 here we are politically. Now, for me, one of the things that immediately uh, uh, occurred to me was, well, you know, the United States, uh, and I'm going to confine my arguments to the United States because that's where I am and that's where I'm uh, sort of, that's what I'm dealing with. Uh, in the United States, there have been uh, some very strong periods of reform. Uh, the progressive movement at the end of the 19th century into about 1910 was one. Uh, the Great Deal, the, the, the New Deal movement of the 1930s was another. The Great Society programs of the 1960s was yet another. And it became clear from the commentaries that were beginning to emerge around the coronavirus and even before that, that something uh, 
of a reform movement was beginning to build and that uh, there, this reform movement uh, began to look like it was going to deal with uh, some of the underlying questions of particularly the social inequality and the two questions which of course were being raised in the Bernie Sanders campaign and all the rest of it were, were climate change and social inequality. Those were the two major, major issues. Uh, that and, and it was social inequality over in education, in healthcare, in, uh, not, not only in, in income streams. So there was a, there was a feeling that, 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 that something had to change. And then along came the virus and just basically confirmed that we needed to do something uh, or other about uh, this whole uh, this whole uh, situation, um, but then to me, I, I'm kind of looking at it and saying, okay, uh, I'm old enough uh, to remember the movements of the 1960s. Uh, I moved to Baltimore uh, from uh, the UK in 1969, uh, the year after. Uh, a large chunk of the city got burned down in, a, 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 I don't know exactly what to call it. You could call it a riot, you could call it a disruption, you could call it a, an urban uprising. I prefer the latter term because at that time, something like 130 cities in the United States experienced an urban uprising uh, and after the assassination of Martin Luther King. And the race question was very much, of course, uh, on, 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 on the agenda. Um, and then I'm sort of thinking to myself, you know, well, are, are we going to go through this all again? Because it was in that context that I wrote my first radical book, Social Justice in the City. It was a, an outcome of me trying to come to terms with the experience of moving to the United States uh, into a situation of urban crises. Uh, and there were two issues uh, as, as a British kind of leftist, I wasn't Marxist at the time, I hadn't read Marx at the time, um, uh, sort of left-leaning, what, 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 what was I going to have to deal with? And there, were, there, were, there was the foundational question of what to do about the fact that here's the richest country in the world where living conditions for a large segment of the population were absolutely intolerable. And one of the issues was to what degree could we come up with social policies which would uh, ameliorate those, those, those living conditions for the mass of uh, the population that was most affected. But there were two issues in the middle of this that were, 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 were very complicated for me to deal with. Uh, the first issue, you'll be surprised to know, was the question of religion. As a leftist coming from Britain, I was not particularly religious. I was, in fact, I was anti-religion, if anything at, at all. But landing in Baltimore, most of the political activism was coming out of the, of course, uh, the churches, the black uh, churches. There was an organization called the Black Ministerial Alliance in Baltimore, which was extremely uh, active uh, and politically. And I, I, I found it very difficult to kind of deal with that situation. The Black Panthers were active there, but they were in alliance with the American Friends Service Committee. So the Black Panthers, the American Friends Service Committee, set up uh, a, uh, a, a, a health clinic, a free health clinic, uh, and at the same time ran a breakfast program for, for the kids. So, so, so the religious content of a lot of this was, was, was really problematic. But the other issue which I had never really confront or had to confront in much of my political life in the 1960s in Britain was, of course, the race issue and the racial inequalities and the racism and uh, the, uh, uh, the like. Um, but I was seeking at that moment also a way of understanding what was happening to urbanization, what was happening in housing markets and things of that kind. And I, I was dissatisfied entirely with all of the the, the, the conventional social science and conventional economic theories. And it was at that time that I started to go off and read capital. And then came the question of what is the relationship between capital and, and, and class, and then between class and race. And this was a, a very, very, very tense sort of situation to try to talk about the class aspects and race aspects at the same time. 
And I always remember somebody saying to me once, like somebody associated with the, the, the Panthers, they said, you know, you have to watch out because in the United States, if you connect race and class, you've got a revolution on your hands and everybody knows that. So anybody that makes that connection is going to be targeted by political power. And that, of course, was one of the stories about Martin Luther King. It was also the story about Malcolm X. It was also the story about Fred Hampton and the, the, the Panthers and the response to the Panthers and, 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 and all the rest of it. In other words, you know, in the United States, there's been a long, long standing kind of attempt by political power of all stripes and even progressive stripes to prevent the bringing together of class and race perspectives. Now, here I am again, and I'm in this situation, and what do I do? I want to talk about the class-race relation. Very difficult to do because right now the issue is on race, and, and, and quite properly so, because, you know, when Black Lives Matter gets good, it's not about Black Lives Mattering, it's about the fact that there is this incredible inequality in the treatment of black people and people of color on the streets by the police. And there's just a long, long history of it. And it was there, of course, very strongly in the 1960s. We thought that there some progress had been made during the 1960s and 1970s. This progress got sort of unloaded, if you like, it got rolled, rolled back during the 1980s and 1990s. And even in popular culture, it became kind of almost acceptable uh, to have uh, you know, shows on television, which, which, which actually lauded police brutality towards criminal populations and the use of those criminal populations as being essentially black populations. That association was really very, very strong. So there's a huge kind of issue here which is, yes, the race issue has to be confronted. But if you don't confront it in relationship to class, then you, you confront only certain aspects of the problem. You can't get to the heart of the problem. So I'm kind of looking at the situation, situation and saying, well, are we going to move into a kind of reform politics of the sort that emerged at the end of the 1960s that tried to deal with, you know, opening up employment opportunities for African-American population, bringing African-Americans into the workforce in a different kind of way, uh, uh, breaking some of the monopoly power that existed in housing markets, but not getting far with it. And we still got that problem very much on, on our hands. So were, were we going to just do that all over again and then sort of let it slide? Or were we really, really, really going to absolutely radically reconfigure uh, what urbanization is about, what urban life is about, how race relations and class relations are set up? Because the class inequalities in this country are absolutely uh, astounding. I, I mean, and this is, again, one of the things that's come out from the sorts of data that we're seeing from uh, the, the victims of the coronavirus. Uh, you know, about 40 or 50% of this country is trying to live on less than $40,000 a year. Most of the people in this country don't have enough uh, assets to last more than about three months before going under. And what we now see is, of course, these generous enhancements of uh, unemployment payments, which last for about three months. Uh, but which will be cut off in August and we'll very, very much soon see something like 40 million people unemployed without any superior kind of uh, payments coming from uh, unemployment. And we're going to have a mass of, 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 of unemployed people, many of whom are not going to have enough money uh, to actually purchase food. The food kitchens right now and the food and, and, and the food system is being stretched thin. The, 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 the kind of the, the provision of free meals, uh, which is going on, is absolutely astounding. There's a huge kind of outburst of voluntary sector movements, uh, and and this is a this is a very you know you know this is something that uh, 
you, you, you feel torn about it. I, would, I support it, and I do support it as much as I can, uh, giving free food to as many people as possible and giving free you know, food packages to as many people as possible. And you see these huge kind of queues of, of, of people uh, lining up for them right now, and they are people who are still getting enhanced unemployment benefits, but they cannot and do not afford, cannot afford. So what we have facing us uh, in, a, in, a, in a month or so's time is a situation where that's going to become an even more chronic problem. We are going to start to see people going hungry. We're going to see people going, uh, pe children going, uh, going close to starvation. Uh, and, and, and this is, this is, this is an, an astonishing prospect. And one of the things I did is I wrote a piece in Jacobin that came out. Actually, it was it, it was written before the, uh, the the George Floyd killing, and I, and I basically said, look, uh, if if this if this condition lasts very long, and if there are 40 million people and it's only reduced in some way to I don't know 30 million people by the re resumption of uh, uh, some forms of employment, if that's the case, then we're likely to see. Uh, disruptions and, and eruptions on the street because while on the one hand uh, it's easy to, produ uh, to, to depict looters as, as people who are out there just trying to take uh, upmarket watches and upmarket sneakers and all the rest of it, uh, there's a certain kind of looting which is about actually just getting free food uh, and uh, that's the kind of looting that it seems to me will start to predominate in the near future unless unless we're very careful so here is a situation where when you when you when you do an analysis of the, both the class con condition and the race condition you see that if you don't address the race com the, the, the the class component of this you're going to end up doing a repeat of the sorts of things that we did in the 1960s now which which does start to try to ameliorate the race condition without addressing the class component. And, and this also, at the same time, politically, uh, it's all along has been a bit of a, a, a problem in this country that by focusing and politically, and the political institutions and, and the people themselves, of course, will tend to focus on race. But if you start to privilege uh, entitlements to a particular racial minority, then this sparks a uh, white working class uh, backlash. And the white working class has not been doing very well in this country either through deindustrialization. So the white working class in many parts of the country is racked with opioid epidemics and all of those kinds of things. So they're doing very badly. So if you come up with politics, which, which, Target and say, okay, we're going to we're going to target uh, an improvement for the for the race, uh, a race-based kind of uh, economic policy. You're going to get a white backlash, and in fact, that's what political power likes. They want a white backlash. They want to keep the white. They want to keep the class divided, which is why you would want to try to come up with a politics which is a universal politics. The thing that is very important about, for example, uh, universal health care, the single payer system, which has never been introduced into the United States, which, which Bernie Sanders was beginning to push. The most important thing about that is the universal health care system does not actually have any kind of racial preference in it. It's all about everybody getting equal access to an adequate health care structure. And if it's, if it's targeted in that way, then the possibility of a backlash from one group which is being left out and another one underprivileged group because white working class has not been doing well at all. One underprivileged group is, is, is left out and another is targeted. If it goes like that, then you increase the tension between white and black. And the system here in the United States, I am convinced the only way in which you can consolidate this class system in the United States in the way you do is to keep the racial distinction alive and well and to keep it ferment, in ferment, which of course is exactly what Donald Trump is about. This is what Donald Trump has actually been uh, sort of pursuing. That's what he's been, been, been pushing. And he's doing a, a not bad job of, of, of heightening that, uh, that racial tension. But that racial tension is fundamental to the maintenance of capitalist class control. 
and this seems to me to be the, the, the for, for me is, 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 is where I'm coming from. Now, I'm simplifying and a lot of people will kind of say, well, okay, that's too easy and so on. Yes, it is uh, to some degree. But it, it seems to me it's foundational for the way in which this particular society works. And, and uh, it, it, it's obvious to me that that's how, it, how, it, how it's working. And what is good about the protests is that they are multiracial now. So for the first time, we started to see multiracial discussions over the race kind of question. And it's possible, therefore, to move from that to a, a, a more universal class perspective in the kinds of reforms which I think are likely to be on the agenda. Now, nobody knows whether you know, Donald Trump is going to get reelected or not. It looks like right now he, he probably won't. Even if he doesn't get reelected, he'll probably stay in power and try and summon the military to keep him in power. You know, I mean, we're, we're expecting all kinds of crazy things like that from, from, from him. But um, but this is the this is the, this is why this is such a crucial moment in this country, and why it is so crucial to start to think about this class race relation. And there is hardly any discussion of that in the media. In the media, it is all about race and racial inequalities, and uh, that is, I think, uh, one of the and, and, and issues get get raised. And, and 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 I find I find myself in this kind of awkward situation i mean to be, to be honest on the one hand i have a, a way of thinking about it which i'm trying to communicate to you here uh on the other hand uh if somebody kind of says to me well are you going to say it's irrelevant to i don't know pull down the statue of colston or whatever my answer is i don't think that's irrelevant at all i think this is a good a fantastic moment to have conversations about that racial history and 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 and, and the like and if I'm asked, you know, what do you think about uh, this organization like uh, uh, the World Central Kitchen, which uh, gets hold of restaurants and revives them so that they give free meals to the populations, and do I support that? And the answer is, yeah, I support that. I mean, feeding people right now is crucial. Getting food packets to people now is crucial. So I support all of that, and I would want to support it financially as much as I can. I can't go out there and actually engage with it uh, personally, but I'll do whatever I can to, to, to support that. So I'm, I'm, I'm supporting all of that uh, on one hand, but on the other hand, I want to say at the same time, look, at a certain point, we really have to start to deal with this whole kind of question of race and class and what it's all about. And is there a way in which there can be a reform which actually treats the question of class inequality uh, from a or, or treats the question of racial inequalities from a class perspective. And that, that seems to me is not me saying, oh, here you go, Marx's position, you think class is more important than race. No, I don't think class is more important than race any more than I think class is more important than gender or anything else. I'm just saying that unless you combine the kind of the questions of race with an understanding of the class dimension, uh, you're going to miss out on something. And I've seen that happen. And that's what happened in the 1960s. That's, that, that's very much central to, to, to what happened. And you ended up creating a politics which fractured class. And to the degree that it fractured class, it, it, it's put Trump with uh, a uh, support base, which it, it's not... In, it's not working class white in the ordinary kind of sense, but it's certainly uh, focused on a disadvantaged uh, white population, which is vulnerable to white nationalist uh, rhetoric and white nationalist uh, sentiments. So those, th 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 that, that division is, 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 is the one that really at some point or other has to be dealt with. So there are two things that worry me about the next election uh, in the United States. One is that Donald Trump will win. And the second thing that worries me is that Joe Biden will win. Because if Joe Biden wins and does not modify his kind of political stance, and I don't really think he's going to try to do that because he's a creature of the establishment in a, in a, in a very foundational way, that what in effect will happen is that that whole kind of divide uh, will be uh, continued and the, the, the excessive control which now exists in, 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 in the capitalist class is going to continue 
to wield its power. Now, behind this, of course, there is also the question of how are we going to cope uh, with the continuation of the virus? Uh, it's, it's here to stay for a bit, and, and until the vaccine is found, we're going to have to deal with it. Uh, I don't know what I'm going to be able to do over the next month or two. I mean, I'm probably going to have to stay cooped up here for the, for the next uh, two or three months. Who knows? I mean, this is, this is really kind of serious uh, stuff here in, 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 in New York. So we, we, we have that, but behind the virus, there, there exists another issue, which is the climate change issue. And I don't think that, the, 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 again, the, the virus reveals a great deal about the climate change issue, at the same time as it's revealing a great deal about the social inequality questions and the racial, racial aspects of social inequality. So the degree that the virus is, is, is connected to the, 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 the climate change thing, um, with, with, it, with some very, very interesting features. Uh, for example, the fact that, you know, the number of airline flights has been cut down enormously and the amount of traveling has cut down enormously and so on. The environmental benefits of, uh, of, uh, of what's happening become, start to become, you know, very, you know, very, very plain. And then that raises the kind of question, are we going to try to come back to the recovery? in such a way if, if you know say in about a year's time when there's a vaccine or something like that what are we going to do we're going to start flying just as much as we did before are we going to build new airports are we going to increase uh, the kinds of uh, activities which uh, which led into uh, this economic collapse uh, um, for example uh, after 2008 there were all these difficulties of finding areas of, uh, for capital accumulation to colonize. And one of the big areas that arose was, of course, uh, tourism. So the number of international tourist trips uh, rose from something like 800 million in 2009, 2010, uh, to 2018, it was 1.4 billion. Now, if you're going to move that number of people around, you need, you need airports, you need infrastructures, all the rest of it. But the great thing about that form of consumption of tourism is that the the, the turnover time of consumption is almost, is, is almost zero. So capital needs to have forms of consumerism where the turnover time is zero. And, and, and tourism is one of them. And the other thing is uh, our staging of events, uh, you know, soccer make games, all this kind of stuff. So, so, so all of that has been, has, has, has been brought to a halt by the virus which allows us to take a sort of perspective on what it is that, and how it was that capital was accumulating in a situation where it was having a hard time finding a market which was viable enough and, 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 and where the turnover time was sufficiently short that, that it could just keep on uh, building it. Um, and this takes me back to uh, the Grundrisse because a large chunk of the Grundrisse is about accelerating turnover time. And, and, and actually talks about the way in which value can be created through acceleration of turnover time. Uh, independent of labor input. That's the interesting thing, because in the Grundrisse, it says, you know, value is not simply labor input, it's also about uh, the speed with which the labor process occurs. And the speed and speed up starts to become significant. And everything has to speed up, including consumerism. And this goes back again to my my, 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 my grandparents, I, I always like to quote the fact that I, I still use my grandmother's uh, knives and forks. And if capital built things that lasted 120 years, which is in fact, this is what, how old these are. If it built things that lasted 120 years, it would have been out of business a long time ago. So it has been avidly building and pursuing the development of a kind of a consumerist economy where there's instantaneous turnover. And, and then we ask the question, is that the kind of life we want to lead? Do we want to live in a world where we ha everything has to change, everything has to, you know, and the only thing that's valuable is some new experience. And so that we get an, an experiential capitalism, a capitalism that sells experience as being, you know, uh, and, and tries to shock and all this kind of stuff. And is that satisfying? Is that what we want? And actually right now, I have certain compensations of the fact that I have not traveled anywhere since, uh, since February. And I'm thinking to myself, when I come out of this, do I really want to start traveling again? 
or do I am I am I you know just happy doing what I'm doing? And, and the answer is well, I, I'd like to get out more than I get out, and I'm I am tired of being locked down. Uh, but but nevertheless, uh, I, I I prefer being locked down in here than than dead in one of those uh, refrigerating trucks that are sit out sit out in the back of Bellevue uh, Hospital. So uh, there's there's the 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 the, 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 the situation. And, and I think that uh, I'd be very interested to hear how, uh, how, things, how things are being seen and worked out in Scotland because, you know, the, the geographical differences are very significant. Uh, and I think the, the, the form of uh, a response to the virus and, and also to other aspects of the situation uh, are, 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 are somewhat varied right now, which is, which, which is healthy because I think it means that there's a good deal of debate and discussion, plenty of things to talk about. And, and I hope that uh, some of the things I've raised with you, uh, if you want to get into them deeper, we can do that in discussion. So why don't I just leave it there because I've been very anxious uh, to, 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 to get some feedback as opposed to sort of speaking to all of these little boxes with all of these images uh, on it. Um, what I'll ask you to do is if you could just use the um, participants function to raise your hand for your group's question. Um, and then if you, under the list of names, there's a button that, that allows you to raise your hand. Once you've done that, I'll add you to the stack and I will lower your hand. Um, just to remind everyone, your mic is muted until you unmute yourself in order to speak. Because there's quite a few groups, what I'll do is I'll take three questions at a time and then invite David to come back on each of those block of questions. So I've got a few people in the stack. So first of all, if I could take Kerry McGahey, uh, Tamara Paulson, and Saria. So first of all, Kerry, if you'd like to come in. Hi there, um, I'm facilitating just because our facilitator disappeared off the Zoom, so I don't know if he got cut off or something, but here I am. I was taking notes, so I got nominated. Um, so firstly, um, we just, our group wanted to thank um, David just because the, the way that he communicated the information was really digestible um, and, and the concept, so thank you for that. Um, we had a really good discussion around the ideas. The question that kind of emerged from my note taking was, um, obviously Scotland's a different uh, landscape um, in terms of race, um, race and class and everything that happens in America. Um, one, of the, one of the people in our group spoke about how in America that history comes from slavery, but in the UK it comes from empire, which was quite interesting because that uh, provided working class uh, people with jobs and so they became attached to it. So then the question that kind of emerged was, how do you deal with, what sort of things can you do to deal with raising consciousness around class? Um, and someone mentioned the idea of, you know, white privilege and coming at it from that perspective. Um, and like you gave examples of Black Panthers had food drives and stuff. Is there other sort of um, suggestions of things that people could do to try and um, marry the consciousness uh, around those two issues, if that question makes sense? Okay, thanks, Kerry. Um, next, we have uh, Tamara. Sorry, David, I'll just take three questions and then we'll, we'll come back. So, Tamara, next. Hi, sorry. Um, uh, our, our question is actually really similar. Uh, we were talking about how to, to bring together honest class solidarity and, and bring together these struggles of race and class because we are seeing that there are problems of race that, that seem to still matter across the spectrum of class, so they can't be totally merged in that sense. Um, and also that race and class are related in different ways. For example, uh, someone in our team mentioned that the police and military uh, often are come from white working class backgrounds. So how do we marry the idea of class when, when these two concepts seem to also be very different? I don't know if that makes sense. But. That's great. Thanks, Tamara. Um, and next question is from Saria. Hi. Uh, good afternoon from Trinidad. Um, well, our question, our discussion was on 
quite a few different topics, but the, the question that we came up with was um, in thinking about how the race class relation, there is a different level of understanding of the problem among youth, especially youth in America, as there might be to older members of the population and members who have been part of the white working class or non-white working class for a very long time. So it, from my experience as a young person, I find that the youth tend to be very well informed and have a bit of a maybe keener eye for fake news and, and non-critical news sources. So is it important that there is a difference between the understanding of the race class relationship in young people who perhaps have less agency a lot of the time than there is for the older generations. Okay, thanks very much. And um, over to you, David, to come back on those questions. Yeah, look, there's a, a, a whole kind of uh, question about you know how we how we think about class and 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 how uh, the the experience of race uh, is is not separate from class but embedded uh, and and in some ways uh, the class relations is embedded in race so that I, I tend to have a kind of very, very relational way of thinking about these categories and not seeing them separate as separate boxes out there that sometimes collide and sometimes don't. Uh, that's the way in which conventional social science tends to look at things, and that's the way in which politics tries uh, to segment things in such a way that we talk about race without understanding the embeddedness in class, and we talk about class without understanding its embeddedness in race. So I, I think that 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 um, I would have a kind of almost a methodological uh, answer to to all of these questions about okay, how, how should we really think about relationship between these two categories. But why don't I leave it there and come back to this maybe uh, a, a little bit later. Okay, no problem. Thanks, David. Okay, so the next three that I'll take are Sinead, Gregor, and Remy. Okay, so Sinead, first of all. Uh, hi, David. Uh, first of all, just thank you for a really informative talk and also just thank you for your contribution to Marxism in general. Um, our group were having a kind of chat about well, lots of things, but one of the kind of things we wanted to ask about was um, kind of ideas of universality. When you're talking about the kind of lack of universal health care in the US um, and really just kind of wanting to know your thoughts on universal basic income, um, particularly at this time. And we also kind of maybe had a bit of a question if you could comment on um, kind of talking a bit about Islamophobia um, and how that's racialized. Um, as well and how maybe through the movements in the US um, kind of Muslim people have maybe found some kind of voice as well through um, the Black Lives Matter movement. I think that's it. Okay, thank you. And next we have Gregor. Yes, so our group drew real encouragement from the international and internationalizing character of the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, but we also kind of spoke to the very different character um, of marginalization in different national contexts. So we were wondering what, what does it mean to map and understand marginalized communities globally and how to effectively connect uh, politically a, across race and class lines. Um, we were also speaking about the fact that sometimes marginalized people um, seek market solutions um, as forms of emancipation. So they seek solutions which are about further market integration um, rather than uh, more radical solutions. So how, uh, as the left, do we effectively um, intervene um, and pose more transformative solutions? Okay, thank you. Uh, and then the last of this round of questions is from Remy. Hello. Hello, oh, yeah. Uh, no, sorry, I think it's uh, Remy that I think was next. Oh, 
Have we lost Remy? Uh, okay. Hi, sorry. No, anyway. Hi, I'm sorry. Oh. My um, Wi-Fi decided to stop working just then. Great timing. Um, is it is it my turn to ask a question? Yeah. yeah. Okay, great. Thanks very much. Um, thank you so much, David Harvey. That was really interesting talk. Um, in our breakout, we were discussing kind of the the interconnections between race and class. It's quite similar, sorry, to a question that was already asked. But we were talking specifically about the historical development of capitalism in tandem with the development of racism and how the history of class formation is inherently intertwined with the history of racialization. I'm thinking about specifically like the work of Robbie Shilliam and others. Um, so with this in mind, like your point was really well taken that race is often used to divide the working class and, and to foment the kinds of divisions that is conducive to the continuation of, of the global capitalist system. But there can't be racial emancipation without class emancipation and vice versa. So how do we move beyond the kind of pervasive um, toxic discourses that seek to divide those groups? Um, moving forward and would you be able to envisage a world in which those divisions were no longer something that we had to contend with? Okay thanks very much for that Remy. Just before I bring David back in it was just to say that I think a few of the groups maybe haven't uh, put anyone forward to come back so it's just that this is your opportunity to, to do so before I bring David back okay. So if, if you want to come back in now David? Um, yeah, well, uh, um, it, it's difficult to to sort of uh, be you know, answer the specific uh, questions. Um, but what I think I would want to do is to uh, we should recognize one of the things that, that that became very important to me towards the end of the 1960s was to recognize that it's not only that race divides class, but class also divides race. Uh, that in the United States, for example, we began to get in the 1970s, 1980s, uh, an educated uh, uh, middle class, and in some instances, uh, even stronger uh, uh, black administrators. For instance, in 1965, six, well, when I first went to the United States, I don't believe there was a single mayoralty in the whole of the United States that was held by a black person. Now, many mayoralties are held by black people. And there's a class divide within the black movement. And I think we have to understand something about, about the way in which class in itself, uh, and you know, in other words, you can't talk about one thing and the other. And this is, I guess, one of the themes that I would want to uh, to get to and I'd, I'd like to actually talk a little bit more about the whole kind of question of where class identity comes from and how to think about uh, class consciousness and all the rest of it but I can do that at the end if you like but so let me just leave it there and come back to, to some of these questions a little bit uh, later. Okay no problem thanks David and um, so the next three speakers that I've got I've got Levin, uh, Julia and then Lewis. Okay, so uh, Levin, first of all. Um, uh, hi, uh, David, it was a wonderful conversation. So my question is, uh, there is a contradiction between Marxism and intersectionality theory. Uh, so uh, like, uh, so how to, uh, what do you uh, kind of think about uh, the internal contradiction between Marxism and intersectional uh, theories and how to uh, bring these two tendencies together? Thank you. Okay, thank you, Levin. And the next question is from Julia. Hello. Um, so our group were kind of talking sim about similar things that have already been brought up about, you know, class and race and how we can kind of bring the two together. But also fundamentally, we have to recognize that racism does exist, like in the working class and maybe that kind of needs to be dismantled for this to really happen and talking about like, um, you know, how capitalism is built on white supremacy. And also we were kind of talking about, um, you know, the American dream about how maybe like the white working class don't really have that as to aspire to as much um, in comparison to like the sixties. And we were also, I was kind of talking about how there are a lot of, um, you know, young black voices who are talking about 
capitalism um, and dismantling that for this movement. So I do think there will be a difference. But yeah, I'm not sure if I have an exact question for you because it will just be repeating what's kind of already been asked. But maybe that's some points to, to discuss. Okay, thanks, Julia. And then um, the last round of questions from this is from Lewis. Hello, um, thanks very much for the uh, brilliant talk, David. And um, just like to say that um, you're a very sort of formative part of my political education as becoming a Marxist. So I very much appreciate that as well. Um, lots of the sort of main thrust of uh, our group's conversation has probably been covered um, already. Um, one point that wasn't that hasn't been covered as of yet, um, and you were present for our discussion because you were in our group, was um, one of the uh, sort of comrades in our group um, said that um, they're from uh, they're currently living in Norway at the moment, which has a strong sort of universal uh, universalized system, um, which tends to uh, look after people uh, in a sort of more effective way than an American system. Um, so how would you suggest in a country like that, uh, I suppose, tackling the roots of um, racial inequality and inequality um, much more effectively and what would be the role for, I suppose, the radical left in a country like that? Um, but I think that mostly uh, the, the questions that we were sort of looking and the, to ask and the sort of points that were raised have mainly been sort of raised previously. So uh, you'll, I suppose you'll come to that at the end. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Lewis. So that, that concludes the rounds of questions from all the groups. So if you want to take a bit of time to come back in on some of those points, David. Okay. Um, yeah, I, 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 I just go back over a couple of things. Uh, universal basic income might be okay as a short-term tactic, but um, pretty soon all it is is about bolstering uh, uh, certain cons consumer power, which will easily be absorbed by uh, monopoly practices in the markets and all this kind of stuff. So I don't think uh, universal basic income is going to work. Um, intersectionality, I, I think uh, that's a sort of uh, rather wooden way of talking about something that, that is much more complicated. Um, I, I think one of the things that is is remarkable is is uh, you know young people I think are very very keyed in and I think there is a, a huge difference uh, between uh, in the United States anyway and I suspect uh, this may be global a huge difference uh, which seems to be uh, between people who are sort of under thirty five and those who are over thirty five you know. Um, basically, my generation is, is is in the way, so you've got to kick me out of the way to get your own freedom. But let me say something about about this. I've been doing well, one of the things in teaching the Grundrisse. I realised is that actually Marx tries to decompose uh, an economy into a number of different circulation processes, and it's a bit like uh, a human body. You know, you have a digestive process, and you have a lung process, and you have a heart process, and it all gets together. And so, the totality of capital is made up of these, these, all these these circulatory processes which are working. So, in the Grundrisse, Marx starts to sort of split it down and say, "All right, what kind of different uh, processes can we look at?" And you know, he looks at says, "Okay, fixed capital has a particular mode of circulation. Other things." The one he does is to say there is a small, what he calls a small circulation process, which is the circulation process of the worker. And I want to just mention this because I think it sheds a lot of light on the whole kind of problematic of how class is understood and how class solidarities might be constructed. And what Marx basically does is to say, look, take the daily life of a worker. The worker goes out into the marketplace and says, I want a job. At that point, the worker is a seller and type plays the role of a seller. They're trying to sell something. They're trying to sell their labor power and they have to sell their labor power in order to get the means of production, which allow them to live. So they're going in there and, and therefore they are going in and they're going into a market and they go in as individuals. They don't go in as a class. They go in as individuals. And, and therefore there is competition between individual workers for the jobs and, 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 and therefore, all kinds of segmentations can come up in terms of who gets preference in the jobs and this kind of stuff. So you've got to look at the worker and then kind of say, what's their experience uh, in the market as they come to sell their labor power? 
what is their experience about and of course it's a, it's a very uh, fragmented experience but it's also one that's segmented in all sorts of different ways once their labor power is hired they go into the labor process so there's a next step in the circulation process is the experience of the worker in the labor process in which the worker is an alienated worker and capital takes the alienated labor and utilizes it for purposes of construction and building a surplus value and this is a class relation between capital and labor so uh, the first relation is a, is a is a seller to buyer relation the second is the capital labor relation they then get some money and once they get money they are actually in the position of having the money and they do what they want with the money and the money uh, they can do all kinds of things with the money they can save it they can spend it they can uh, put it into investment they can try and build a possibility of new investment so so as as as, as a holder of money they have a particular persona and they can look after their pension funds and their pension rights and all this kind of stuff so as as a as as as, as a person who has control over money they have a, they adopt a particular persona and that persona is very different from the persona they adopt in the labor process or in the market but they then take the money and they, a lot of it and they take it into and become a buyer now how do they buy and who do they buy from and what's the relationship between buyers and sellers and how much do the do the sellers exploit them uh, by monopoly pricing which is one of the reasons i don't like universal basic income because if you give universal basic income and you don't control uh, what capitalists are doing in terms of uh, the selling of goods then uh, you, you know in the united states we have this huge kind of scandal about pharmaceutical prices and so on so that, that uh, if you give universal basic income it'll simply jack up the market for the pharmaceutical companies to, to use their monopoly power to extract as much of that wealth as possible so you have that, that set of, and then they take the commodities they can buy in the market and they take it home and you get into social reproduction and there's a vast literature now on social reproduction theory and what goes on at the moment of social reproduction uh, so the, the, what Marx does is to set up and says, well, a worker has all of these experiences. They experience his life as a seller, as, as a worker in the labor process, as, as a financier, as, as, a, a, as a buyer of commodities, and as somebody who's engaged in social reproduction. Now, which one of those experiences is going to dominate in the worker's mind? And that actually then plays a very crucial role in the kind of consciousness that people have. If people feel they're being exploited by the pharmaceutical companies, they, 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 you know, it's going to be a, a clash between, uh, between buyers and sellers uh, that's involved. The experience in the labor market has a certain kind of thing. So what Marx does is to say, the worker has all these different experiences. Uh, and which one matters is, is, is crucial. I mean, I, I sort of, worked a little bit with with uh, the whole kind of question of what happened in, in, in Lordstown in Ohio. And it was clear from the interviews with the workers that the, the notion of the family was terribly important. And, and actually a lot of people kind of said, okay, we can put up with all that nonsense in the workplace and all that kind of stuff, provided I end up with enough money to go and have a good time and, and enjoy my family. Now, if it's about enjoyment of family or something of that kind, then you get a different kind of politics than if it's radical re reorganization uh, in, in the labor process. So the point here is to say that the experience of the working person is going to be radically different depending upon which one of those roles they're adopting. In other words, the positionality of the worker in their circulation process undergoes metamorphoses or transformations as they move from one role to another so they have as it were five different roles which they're going to actually experience and those roles are important and affect their consciousness which one of them then they select as being significant and important well you read Andrew Gortz and he'll talk about compensatory consumerism that actually basically uh, the capital says to the worker, okay, put up with shit work and on the other hand, you can go home and you have your wages and you'll have a, a, a compensatory good life because the consumerism would be nice. If consumerism turns out not to be nice, then you can do something else. So my, 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 my point here is that conscious, the consciousness of people, if Marx is right and he, he kind of says, well, consciousness does not sort of arise out of you know descend from heaven or anything of that kind it arises out of experience and if the working person has experience in these different modalities at different days of life then how do you put it all together in terms of a class movement in other words a class movement and this is where 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 
people like myself and, and, and all of you are terribly important is to sort of ask the question, how do, how, how do we take those, all those different experiences and the tendency of people saying, well, okay, I actually want more of the market because, you know, or I want less of the market or, I, you know, how, how, how do we take all of that and start to, to, to work at it in terms of, 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 of real politics? Now, for some time now, I've been sort of saying to myself, well, who, who is the working class in the United States right now? And, and, and I, I increasingly would kind of look at the, uh, at the situation in an airport. An airport, very, very important employer of labor until this last disaster struck. Who is it you see in the airport? It's African-American people of color, it's Hispanics and migrants, and it's waged women. And they are the ones who actually uh, make the airport work. Uh, and, and you kind of say, that's the contemporary working class. And that is class. They have an experience. And furthermore, they have a lot of power. Because if enough people decided that they were going to close the airports down in the United States, you basically stop the economy. Now, when you start to look at who has been supporting life in New York City uh, during this whole pandemic, it's exactly the same group. It's exactly the same group. So there is a class formation there, and it is already segmented in terms of race, but it has a coming together. It is actually, in terms of its experience of what life is like in the airport and running the airport, or what life is like in the hospital, uh, dealing with the pandemic and all the things that go with it, and what's the life like of uh, keeping the grocery stores open and all the rest of it, then, 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 then you see the, the, the class. Now, there's a lot of discussion about, okay, where's the working class? Well, the factory working class, the classic factory working class, is less and less important compared to this working class. And this working class, when you start to say, well, what's their experience about in the labor process? But what's their, their, their experience about as they go into the market to sell their labor power? Do they confront racial prejudice? Do they uh, confront uh, religious prejudice? Do they, you know... Are, 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 there, are there segmentations? And how do you break those segmentations down? And how do you actually prevent individual competition? Because individual competition in the labor process means that I, as an individual worker, am likely to denigrate somebody else. Uh, you know, one of the things I have to say to an employer is that person over there is a lousy worker. I'm the one you want. So when you, you, you start to look at competition, in the labor process, you start to see sort of some ugly things start to, to, to emerge. And the big question then arises, all right, what would a class perspective do about this? It would try to organize the labor process and the buying and selling of labor power in such a way that it has a certain market character. And or if we're in capitalism, it's going to have a market character in some kind. So how, how do we organize it in such a way that those segmentations don't actually uh, fragment uh, the consciousness of the worker and you start to say, well, there's some collective way in which we can actually organize labor markets so that it's, they're much fairer and they're much more significant. And to some degree, you know, uh, the legislation and equal opportunity legislation and so on uh, does some of that. So my point here would be to say, when we come up with these categories, we should try to ask questions about what's the material base of a lot of the thinking which is going on because we can have abstract kind of notions of which coming from Marxism and so on and yeah they, they, they are abstract but at the same time Marx is trying to say that we have to actually start to look and, and when he talks about this small circulation of, 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 of labor through these different roles we have to look at the performance of those different roles and the kinds of consciousness that arises out of forming those different roles and if there is one form of consciousness which can contradicts another that how you behave as a buyer of commodities is not the same as how you buy, behave as a seller of your labor power but there are ways in which you can start to put all of that together so the life experience of the population becomes significant and this is one of the things i i really enjoy about you know teaching the grun or something like that because it raises these questions about what's the life experience of a worker and their experiences. And if you try to find a solution to the problem of what would happen to the working class, simply by taking one of those elements and saying that is the solution, and you don't touch all of the others, then the totality will defeat you.
and it's the, it's the totality that Marx is talking about, which is significant. It's the totality we have to work with. And what we see around us are people who are in the working class who draw their identity, do a politics of recognition, a consciousness that arises out of, say, reproduction processes, and which has nothing to, you know, and, and, and abandon any kind of discussion of what goes on in labor processes. You have exactly the opposite things going on with some people in the labor processes. So I think that this is one of the, one of the ways of thinking about things. And I think that one of the things uh, I'm very interested in is, uh, and, and thank you for making some generous comments about uh, you know, my contribution to, to understanding Marx, is that when, it, when, when, when you understand that that is what Marx is saying, then you start to look at the notion of class through a different lens. It's not a wooden sociological category. It's something which happens to individuals who are constantly in this kind of circular process and are caught up in this, in this circulation process and live their lives in this circulation process and find themselves performing different roles and thinking different thoughts and different possibilities and having different uh, uh, ambitions uh, depending upon where you are. In this whole kind of circulation process, so forgive me for for, for so sort of ending up with a little bit of a a, a a little bit of a lesson out of the Grundrisse, but it, 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 I, but I think it's fascinating, no? Uh, and, and I think when you start to say, well, that circulation process is very different from the circulation process of capital, because capital is in a process which is M C M prime, which means it's got to expand, whereas the worker is in a C M C. I have commodity. I want to get commodities circuit. And that's very, very different. So there's no expansion required on the workers circuit, but there is an expansion required on the capitalist circuit with all the kind of problems which attach uh, to that. So uh, this, is, this, is, this is where I think the theory or, or, or theoretical reflection, and it's not so much theory of kind of, okay, this is the absolute theory of everything. It's a, it's, it's, it's a, a mode of reflecting. On, on what's happening to people and, and, and the like. So I, I, I think of this, what Marx calls this small circulation process when I look at the, the people uh, in, in the airport working or I think of it when I'm looking at the people who are actually in the middle of being, you know, fighting this coronavirus on the front, on, on, on the front lines. So, okay, forgive me for, for, for going off in this kind of direction, but you know, I can never resist. And I, besides, I'm so caught up with reading the Grundrisse these days, I can't get it out of my head. Okay, um, thanks very much, David. I think I'm going to have to get myself involved in those Grundrisse uh, podcasts now after you, after you talking about it. Um, we really appreciate you coming and joining us today. It's been a really interesting meeting, really informative, and it would be absolutely brilliant to, to have you back again sometime soon. Well, good, good luck and everything to everybody because this is a very, very important moment and I hope that you can manage to, you know, change the world and, you know. Absolutely. Thanks very much. Um, so for next week, we're going to be looking at a session discussing the police. There's been calls recently to defund the police and we'll be asking what exactly would that look like? Is it a realistic demand that it's something that we can achieve? And how would we go about achieving that end? If you'd like more information about the upcoming lectures, if you go to the website at contour.co.uk, you can also join the mailing list and the WhatsApp group and keep up with all of our content by following us on Twitter and on Facebook. We also have a podcast that you can listen to on Spotify, Apple and everywhere else you get podcasts. I believe there's now a YouTube channel as well that you can watch that on. Um, that includes um, two of our very own, Cat Boyd and David Jameson, who combine an eclectic mix of contemporary politics and culture. You'll receive an email from us with a link to all of these things after the meeting. And all that being said, that's pretty much everything. Thanks very much for joining us and have an excellent evening. Hopefully see you next week. Good luck and thank you. Thank you. Thank you.